evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome, a very warm welcome to the BLSI. Uh, it's such a pleasure to see so many people of you uh, today. In fact, I think I'm not wrong by saying this is probably the most uh, popular talk we've ever had at the BLSI, because in addition to the 100 plus people in the room, we have another nearly 80, 90 people online. So, you know, this, this, is, this is really uh, our first truly sold out event of online offer. So welcome, and I hope uh, you very much enjoy it. And um, before I hand over to our main attraction tonight, which everybody will know uh, without his, mentioning his name, I need to go through a few admin things. So the first thing is for everybody in the room, in the case there is a fire drill or fire alarm, then uh, we would need to vacate the building. The way to do that is to form an orderly queue, go down the stairs that you've come through, up through, leave the building at the front door, turn right to the end of the road and turn right again and, and uh, congregate at Chapel Green. And hopefully it won't be raining. But this has never happened. So it's very unlikely that you will have to evacuate. But just in case. Okay, so that's really all for the audience in the room. As far as the online audience is concerned, um, there's so many of you as well that you cannot unmute and show your video uh, at the moment. We will be able to do that at the end of uh, John's presentation. Now, th there's different ways of asking a question. Please use the chat room for you, for those of you who are online, and use the chat room facility to ask questions, and I will pick them up uh, on the way. You can also uh, raise your hand when you unmute and show your video during the Q&A session, and I will enable that for you. Or you can electronically raise your hand uh, in Zoom. And that really is it. Just for everybody to know that this will be a recorded talk tonight, and uh, we will internalize John on our Virtual Browser YouTube channel in about four weeks' time. But without further ado to the main event of the evening, John Gray is a political philosopher who cut his stripes at Exeter College, Oxford, where he got his, his bachelor's, his master's, and his doctorate. He then taught at Exeter University before returning and tutoring at Oxford. Uh, and he's also been a visiting professor in many different universities, including Harvard and, and Yale. And uh, he ended his career at the London School of uh, Economics and Social Sciences in 2008 as the professor of European thought. And uh, he is a prolific writer, as you probably all know. He must have uh, written more than two dozen publications, including The False Dawn of Capitalism, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, issue around uh, religion, and, and politics, and uh, his viewpoints on humanism will come out long, loud and clear today. Uh, other books that include, and I think the one that you're most famous for is, is actually written 20 years ago this year, Straw Dogs. Uh, but he's here today, not for any of this, he's here today to share his thoughts on his latest book, Feline Philosophy, Cats and the Meaning of Life. So before I hand over to John, I also wanted to mention that he's done lots of uh, radio uh, broadcasts on Radio 4 points of view. And he's by definitely the only movie star philosopher that I've ever introduced for his role in the 2011 film Marx Reloaded. So there you go. We have a film star in our midst. I hand it over now to John Gray. Thank you all for coming on this rainy evening and thank you Andres for that very generous introduction and I'd also like to thank uh, Betty Sukar who uh, originally suggested I give this talk and also say a word about the wonderful conversations I had with Victor Sukar, uh, Betty's late husband, who was instrumental in um, moving on and uh, this institution. And uh, I uh, still remember those conversations very vividly. Cats and philosophy. Well, why write a book on cats and philosophy? Well, the spur of the book came about 30 years ago 
when I was talking to a then well-known philosopher, I'm not sure whether he's still living or not, but I, I won't mention his name, but this is a true story, who told me that he'd um, persuaded his cat to become a vegan. And I said, oh, uh, that's jolly interesting. You must have had some excellent arguments. And he said, oh, over time, the cat uh, fully accepted this and um, uh, um, embraced the vegan life. And I, um, veganism, by the way, is a perfectly legitimate choice for humans. But I found it slightly anomalous that he would think it appropriate to cats. And I did, I thought he was joking. So I said, um, well, how does it work? Do you give the cat um, mouse tasting uh, artificial food of some kind? Or do you, um, how, how do you actually do it? And he got visibly annoyed. I wasn't taking him seriously enough. Um, and it then occurred to me, well, this surely can't work because cats are programmed by evolution to be predators. The most important thing in their life in the wild is meat living meat. Um, they stalk, they have all the practices and skills of a, of a predator. So uh, I said, well, how does it work? He said, oh, I give it the uh, mild tasting soya. He didn't say that, but whatever it was. And um, they're very happy. And I said, and then said, well, does the cat go out? <laughs> Capital O. And uh, he said, yes. So there we are. <laughs> we have the solution. The cat would supplement its soya diet with um, uh, things it hunted and other other people's food from other houses, because as any, any, any of you know who have, have cats, they're quite liberal in their view of to whom they belong, basically no one except themselves. So they'll go off to other houses, so that's how it really uh, worked well. Um, the conversation ended, but it planted in my mind a number of questions, which I pursued 30 years later in this book. And um, I suppose the first one was, why would anyone think that cats have anything to learn from us? Why would anyone think that cats need lessons from us, um, particularly from a philosopher, perhaps? Um, cats already know how to live. They don't have to be instructed in how to live. They have all the equipment, the instincts, the skills. Uh, um, um, even if they're um, supposedly domesticated. Uh, by the way, I then looked into the history of feline domestication and found that quite genuinely and almost literally, they, domest they domesticated themselves or us rather than being domesticated by us. They seem, cats seem to have entered human households about 12,000 years ago in what is now Turkey, when those households were first set up around um, in settlements around uh, grain stores. And in the grain stores, there were rodents. And the cats were attracted by the rodents, but they were also um, uh, learned to live with people, uh, with human beings. And they learned to, I think what they learned was how to induce humans to love them. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult actually, because they are very lovable, but at least, at least um, I, I feel so. And without actually accepting any duties, and without becoming partly human, as dogs have become, the soul of a dog, a domesticated dog, is partly human. And that's why many people love dogs. Nothing wrong with that, but it's quite different from cats. Cats will remain genetically, and in, if I may call them their souls, non-human. If you want a window out of the human world, have a cat. Because a cat isn't in the human world. It, it, it moves in the human world, but it's not of the human world. It's still outside of the human world. And yet it can love, it can come to be fond of and even love in its own feline way, the humans who care for it and uh, give it, give it, a, give it a, at least a, a temporary um, um, home. So the, so the first thing I guess I was puzzled by and thought about uh, after this conversation 30 years ago was why anyone would think Cats needed lessons from us and anything. In fact, we might learn from them. Not that they would teach us anything, because they're so confident in themselves of their own superiority over other living things, including particularly humans, I think. Never dream, they would never dream of trying to instruct humans because they wouldn't think humans were intelligent enough to be instructed. 
Um, and so that was my first thing. But my second thought was about ethics, ethics. Um, uh, this philosopher, like many philosophers, by no means all, and not like the Greek philosophers, actually, thought of it, thought of really um, of the good life uh, as involving certain prohibitions or commands. That is, they thought of ethics as what we now call morality. I don't just mean sexual morality or even particularly that, just morality. What is morality for many people? It's a series of things you should and shouldn't do. And um, I was puzzled that those things should be thought to be the same for different species because cats have different natures from human nature. I do think there is such a thing as human nature, by the way. Very unpopular view now, but I do think that. And there's also feline nature, and they're different. So I'm not saying we should become cats or even like cats. Cats are cats, humans are humans. We each have our different natures. Um, but with those different natures, we have different forms of the good life. That was, by the way, the ancient um, Greek view. Aristotle, I don't, in general, admire Aristotle all that much, but he, he, he did um, write about the good life in other species. He wrote about long before animal rights. So he wrote about uh, the ethics of dolphins. He said, dolphins have virtues. They hunt together, they help each other. And this was based on observation. He'd actually gone out in a fishing boat and looked at them and so on. Um, so Aristotle thought that the, um, the best life, I have to say, he was a little bit partial, if I might put it like that, on who could live this. You'd have to be Greek. You'd have to be male. You'd have to be a property owner. You're just narrowing it down pretty much. <laughs> I mean, I'm the whole of human, the human species, male Greek property owner. Uh, um, um, but if you're in that favoured position, um, the good life has a certain form, which he connected with his theory of human nature, in which he thought wrongly, in my view, that reason was the key for, for human nature and therefore the highest form of life for human beings. Remember, he thought they were hierarchical. He thought that human good lives could be ordered in a hierarchy, the best life, best life. For these few human beings who could live it was that of a philosopher. Uh, it's interesting if you read, by the way, his account of friendship. Basically, I often, when I re you read him on friendship, I often wonder why he didn't just buy a mirror. Um, a, friend, a friend, he thought, was someone very like yourself. A great soul man, great soul. It's interesting, by the way, because there's not an iota of humility. Humility wasn't a virtue for Aristotle or Homer. People think that the same virtues are recognized throughout human history and all cultures. They're not. I know, didn't even have time to dismiss for humility. It never occurred to him to be humble. Um, but, um, so the, but the best life was the life which was most in accord with a, a person's nature. And ancient Chinese thought, on which I'm not an expert, has something rather similar to that. So each, each species, or even maybe each individual, has his or her way down. And the best life for them is to live that way, according to that way. So um, if you think that way, if you think, sorry, in, in that kind of um, mode about ethics, you wouldn't think of ethics as being about commands and prohibitions. You wouldn't think that everyone or even all living things, perhaps as well as humans, should obey the same rules or principles or laws or commands. You would think that different species and even different individuals um, might, the, the, the good life, the best life for each individual might be different from the lives of other people. And that was later on, much later in, the history of thought in Europe was the view of Benedict Spinoza, the Dutch Jewish philosopher I admire very much, in which he said he, he rejected Aristotle. He said, because species, the best life for all human beings, just an abstraction. What we really have are lots of different individuals. And so the life of one, best life for one individual could be quite different from the best life of another individual. Could even be the best life of a particular moment of that person's life. Might be better, might be different from the best life in that for that very same person later in his or her life. And so this it stirred me to think about ethics, and so I tried to think of what a, a, a feline ethics might be, a feline ethics might be. And um, I came down to the view I called it selfless egoism. And what I meant by selfless egoism is cats only care about what's dear to them, which if they're female cats includes their kittens. And uh, they're ready to die. They're ready to fight to the very death, even to certain death to protect their kittens. But apart from that, they live for themselves alone. And that goes against, of course, a common view of ethics, which is that ethics is about altruism. 
ethics is about caring about other people. It's not the view of not Aristotle's view. It's not the Chinese view actually either. But so you can have a kind of. On the other hand, they do, they're not selfish in the way that humans are selfish or can be selfish because they have no conception of themselves as a separate ego. Human beings, when they talk about being selfish, they either mean satisfying their current desires or achieving some kind of image in society, projecting an image in society, being the cleverest, the richest, uh, the be most beautiful, the thinnest, uh, the fastest runner, the, uh, the most gorgeous. It's, don't seem to have a self-image like that. And that can be tested, by the way. If you, there's a mirror test for non-human creatures, where, do they recognize themselves in the mirror? Just don't. Uh, um, certain types of primate do, um, um, and some people even think certain types of birds with cliffs don't. And um, that's important because when I come on to say what I think cats can teach us, one of the things that they can teach us is not to live your life in order to embellish an image you formed of yourself. If you live your life to embellish an image you formed of yourself, it might be that actually the best life for you is the one you miss living. You might go to your life having missed it. So that was 30 years ago. I should also mention, however, that over that 30 year period, my wife and I had four cats, um, the last of whom uh, died just recently at the ripe old age of 23. He was the most tranquil, the most sweet, and the most loving. In some ways, we loved them all, and they, I think, loved us. But um, he was the most sweet. And I always felt about him uh, what a Russian, the Russian linguist who deciphered the Mayan code, the Mayan hieroglyphs, um, a great man, did this in the 1950s. When he sent his book in with the uh, decipherment of the Mayan codes, it was co-authored by himself, Professor Krominoz, I think, Krominoz, and Asya, his Siamese cat. Mm -hmm. And uh, he continued to do that with all of his works till he died. And every time the publishers refused to do it. So every time he insisted on a photograph being put in with him cradling his absolutely gorgeous Siamese cat, who he insisted on regarding as his co-author. And there's something in that because what, cats do, they don't have the intellectual capacities to engage in um, the intellectual work you're doing, um, but they, um, they create an atmosphere of a climate which is at the same time fills you with a sense of another sentient being while you're working, but isn't invasive. You don't feel you're invasive, invaded by them. They're not trying to get you to in interact with them in some way that pleases you. Sometimes they might do. I once gave a live radio interview on Radio 4, it was at one o'clock, I think it was supposed to be about three million listeners. And I had my, 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 one of my cats on my um, uh, and knee and whether it was, I don't know what it was, maybe she disagreed with something I said, but she knocked my coffee out of my hand, spilled it all over the room, just swiped it, just like that. Um, nobody knew because um, I managed to carry on the interview. But they're very uh, tranquil um, companions. So I've got to the second point of, of what I um, thought about cats and philosophy, about ethics. Is ethics really to do with everyone obeying the same rules, everybody um, and even other species having the same rules, or is it to do with living the good life? Now for the Greeks, from whom the word, from whom the word ethos comes, didn't think of morality as a separate part of um, how to live. They thought of ethics, as they call it, as the art of life. So ethics included things like prudence, cleanliness, beauty, all the ways you can live well or badly. And if we put out of our minds the, the very hierarchical view that they, Aristotle and others took, uh, I think it's a very, it's a good way of, of thinking of ethics, which is that ethics is the art of life. So it isn't just about what we narrowly think of as justice or um, uh, rights or sticking to certain rules of various kinds. It's about how to live well. And um, in that regard, um, I began then to think that cats had something to teach us. Cats who have no philosophy because they don't need one can teach us who have philosophies what our philosophies haven't taught us. And going back into the history of philosophy then, as I did, I came up with some ideas about philosophy. Uh, as practiced in the past. 
um, which are relevant, directly relevant to what I'm about to say. If you look at the three European classical schools of philosophy, skeptics, Stoics, and Epicureans, you might think they're all looking for truth. None of them are. They're looking for what they called ataraxia, which meant peace of mind, tranquility. They all say that explicitly, by the way. I'm not just projecting that on them. They say, we are looking to achieve a kind of um, uh, immovable or in, uh, invulnerable peace of mind, tranquility, which isn't shaken by the events of life, by the, uh, by the shocks of life, by the prospect of death or of very real prospect in those days of being taken as a prisoner and becoming a slave or having your city raised. It's become a real prospect again, of course, since then. Um, uh, raised, to, raised to nothing. They were looking for a kind of um, therapy almost against anxiety. Philosophy for them was a way of fortifying themselves mentally, inwardly, against these shocks. Nowadays, I suppose, you take things like cognitive behavior therapy, some of you may have heard of that, where you try and, the people who practice it, I've known some who say they benefited quite a bit from it, trying to alter their beliefs and check on their emotions and make sure they're not um, trapped in um, restrictive ways of thinking that make them less happy than they would be. And I think that's what philosophy was among the ancients. Um, uh, it had more, it was more like what we now call therapy and also more like what we now call religion than philosophy has since become. When I studied philosophy in the 1960s in Oxford, the core of it was logic. I learned a lot from it, by the way. I, I learned how to tell bad arguments from good arguments. And I, I now think that's all that philosophy can do. It can help you to teach, it can help you to, to reason better, to think better, more clearly. That's it. It hasn't got any answers to anything. But it can help you to think more clearly and not to be taken in by nonsense or, uh, or weak, weak arguments. But in, in, in my day uh, in Oxford, back in the 60s, if you said that philosophy was about how to live, you'd have been, uh, the eyebrows would have raised all over Oxford. Um, uh, people would have looked down at you as a kind of uh, primitive peasant-like figure. Um, uh, what philosophy was then was the core of it was logic. And the idea was almost that philosophy would become a science. I don't think philosophy is like that. I think it's more like religion, more like therapy, and more like art. What philosophers do is almost produce things like paintings. They produce views of the world. Now, just as I think there isn't one, one true painting of anything in the world, if you ask what would be a true painting of this building, there can be many tr truth, truish, or truth, um, truthy, truthy paintings of this of this building. There can also be some that are not true. So there are some errors in our thinking. There are some things that are false. We can eliminate them, perhaps. But we can't um, uh, converge on a single view that's um, true. So that, and also, I mean, most philosophers never, though they all pretty well claim to be looking for the truth, you'll, you'll find if you study philosophy, they almost always try to defend the prejudices and practices of their own society at the time. I mean, philosophy is, the, is it, as practiced commonly, is the, the business of finding reasons for you, what you believe already. Um, uh, and that's what Aristotle did. They all thought that women were inferior. They all thought that non-Greeks were barbarians and they were inferior. They all thought most, nearly all, one or two didn't, but nearly all thought that slavery was okay. So he defended them, all these views. And most philosophers are actually like that. Philosophies don't do that. There are some, of course, are rare. Um, so where does that, what does that lead me to think? What is it about cats? that we can learn from them. Why is it that they're so different from us? Well, thinking about that and living with cats for 30 years, I formed certain conclusions. Um, I also read a lot about cats, but scientific literature and artistic and fictional literature, and also memoirs of cats, memoirs of life with cats. I'll mention two particular ones uh, quickly in a moment. But I think a number of things that are relevant, first of all, Cats, to take the most fundamental, cats, unlike humans, don't think of their coming deaths until they're almost upon them. If you've ever kept a cat and it's got really ill, you'll know that right towards the end of it, as it's approaching death, but not before, as it's almost upon it, it knows and usually surrenders and welcomes it. That's, they just go somewhere and, 
X, Y. And that's a very fundamental point that because what it means is that although cats can have some intuition of something about to happen to them, they don't have a sense of their own mortality. Humans seem to have had a sense that we're of our own mortality for maybe 100 or 200,000 years because that's when they started, human beings started um, leaving things to be used in the afterlife, started burying people with implements and utensils and so on. So there seems to have been a point in human prehistory where we understood that we're mortal. And being mortal doesn't mean just that we're, um, other human beings will die. It means that we know each of us that he or she will die. In other words, that our life is finite. It's inalterably finite. Because there are people, by the way, who nowadays say that's a technological problem. Uh, back in the 80s, I used to go out to California and I met some of these people. In those days, they were all having, setting up uh, uh, policies, insurance policies to have themselves frozen after they died somewhere in the Nevada desert or somewhere. There were cheap old policies where you could just have your brain frozen as well. Mm. They were all exposed to the same risks, which I cruelly pointed out to them, which is that, um, I said, how long do you think it would take for the technology to be developed so that you can be brought back? They'd say, well, a hundred years. I said, well, have you thought what happened in the last hundred years? Of course, no. Civil War in America, the 1929 crash, two world wars, you think this little, what's it called, this little firm out in the bar will still be there? Still be solvent? You want to run away with your money? There won't have been power cuts? This was before climate change, by the way. Um, there won't have been power cuts? They were horrified by that. They assumed that their own society was immortal. We don't know, we know it isn't. Um, um, but um, so, so certain human beings think that Death is a soluble problem, or if you're religious, you think that the human story goes on to bodily death. And that's an important point again about cats, because I think the fact that they don't have a notion of their own mortality means they don't actually tell their lives as stories. We have a great tendency, I think we humans, it's a good tendency in many ways, to give meaning to our lives by telling stories about them. This could be very good. We can we can be ennobled by it. We can we can fit our stories in with other, with other people's stories and so on. But it can also have, a, have problems because if you hang the meaning of your life on that story, then when the story breaks down, you'll be very unhappy. Um, if you think your life has got ten chapters, and you only you get to chapter seven and it looks as if something terrible is going to happen, it can be pretty awkward. You might have a you might have a nice surprise and find it has twelve chapters. Uh, but you don't actually know because none of us knows when they're going to die, at least until we're perhaps again on, on, on the brink of it. Um, and there's another risk of telling your life as a story, which is that you want other people to share your story. So they appear in your story as characters in your story. They might have a completely different story. They might not want to play a role in your story. Um, I remember reading about the uh, the early Bolsheviks in Russia, when they drove into peasant villages to put on futuristic dramas to the baffled and often starving peasants. And um, apart from anything else, it struck me that basically they wanted the peasants to become part of their story. They were going to liberate the peasants, whether the peasants wanted to be liberated or not. And if you form an obstacle to someone's story, there's a rather deep-seated human tendency to try and remove that obstacle by removing you from the story, from the world, and all the way right out through um, human history and the history. Of, so there are risks in this story, but cats aren't like that. It's not to say many people, cats live in the present, they say. They have no sense of time, it's not true. If you have a cat, you'll know that cats very well know when their breakfast is due. They know that some hours before, <laughs> some time before, and they'll come and volubly, relentlessly complain if it's not there where it should be at the time. It's not that they have no sense of time. They don't have a sense finally developed a sense of time as humans have, but um, as we humans have. But, but it's more that they don't tell their lives as stories. They take what happens as it happens when it comes. But that has a very deep meaning, which is that they don't see their lives as being meaningful because they correspond to a story. It's the sensation of living itself, which gives kind of a cat meaning to its, to its life. And in this respect, I'll just briefly, before I, I don't want to go on too long, mention a couple of the cat memoirs I'm very fond of. 
One is a book you could get off the internet. The other is one you could buy German toppings. Um, the first is a book called The Cut from Hue. Now, how many of you recommend, recognize that? Hue was a city in, in, in Vietnam, which was completely, almost completely destroyed in the Vietnam War. And um, it's a terrible thing. It was said that it had to be destroyed in order to be liberated. I think if a cat could, as a sense of humor, would find that sort of rather gruesomely humorous. But the story is actually about a cat from Hue. Um, it's a true story. It was written by a then very famous war correspondent who found this tiny, seemingly black, dragon, one-eyed, starving little cat um, in Hue in the middle of all the chaos and war. Offered it some, something to eat, the cat took it, and he took the cat back to Saigon. When he got to Saigon, he cleaned the cat, which was an extremely difficult task, the cat didn't want to be cleaned, and found it was white, not black. Cat lived with him in Saigon as a war correspondent, developed into an extremely proud, fierce, skillful, cunning, agile cat, fearless, but ready to run away <laughs> when needed. Um, used to sit on the window ledge, looking down at the uh, city in the middle of the war with, with the uh, traffic and so on. And when he left um, Saigon, the war so took the cat to America, uh, where he lived in the cat, lived with the cat in New York and then upstate New York. And when he eventually left there and came to Britain, lived in London, and the cat lived in London with, with him and his wife until it died, I think at the age of 13, after in many incredible escapes in its life, run over, almost blown up, almost put in a pot and eaten when it was in Vietnam, died of the weather, English weather, sadly. But the fascinating thing about this cat is that um, it wasn't completely unscarred by its experiences, but it was different from humans. It did remember in some deep part of itself the trauma it had suffered, but it never um, seemed to affect it, except when some sound um, reminded it of what it had experienced as a tiny kitten. And the sounds it hated were vacuum cleaners, presumably because they were like helicopters. Or, and it invariably, they had great difficulty for these years of keeping the cat in keeping housekeepers, because it always attacked the housekeeper when we're using the bathroom cleaner. And that's a rather profound, because it means the trauma in a cat is there, but it's not stuffed into the unconscious the way traumas are in humans, and then can't, didn't, can it comes out with symptoms. Humans try to force into their unconscious minds, at least this is what Freud thought. They try to force it that the unpleasant, the painful aspects of their lives, well, they actually don't go away, they creep out. You become obsessive thoughts, obsessive takes, obsessive symptoms of it. Cats are not the same. They don't have an unconscious in that sense. So unless there's something that reminds them forcibly or something that traumatized them before, they live without those kinds of memories. They live, in this sense, they, they live in the present and not in the past or the future. They live in the present and the near future. Let's put it, put it like that. That was called Meow, and you can... You can read you can read about this cat in my book, or you could go back and get the, uh, the longer book, which is mostly about the war, but as the title of the, the cat from Hue suggests, um, also about the cat. Second one is a, a very profound book, I think. You can get it in toppings along with my books. Um, um, it's called The Lost Cat. It's by the American writer Mary Gates, a very good book, American writer. And it's about a tiny little cat she adopted in, um, in Italy when she was in Italy, brought back to America, lived with for six months, and then the cat's lost forever, forever, never, never found it again. So it's a completely tragic book in many ways. She went mad, basically, I think. She wouldn't mind. If you read what happened again, so she, she was unhinged by this, because the cat had given her something in her life, but somehow, by looking for the cat, she looked for the cat for about a year, uh, she consulted mediums, spiritualists, and others. The local sheriff, uh, she found her. She hired expensive cat finders, never found it. But in the course of um, that um, search, she somehow unraveled mm. because the cat had always been happy, it had always been brave, it had always been fearless, it had always been 
had joy in life, somehow unraveled her own complicated and painful feelings in her own life, which were partly about her father, who was, she had a very complicated conflict of treatment, who, who, who was dying of cancer and did in fact die. And also about a, a child she'd adopted, great difficulties there of various kinds. She said that this little cat had such a profound radical experience, or a radical impact on it, that it unlocked the contradictions of her own life. And she went on and lived better than she looked up. So that's just kind of that's a happy, happy kind of um, um, ending. So how will I how will I uh, um, conclude this? Well, I'd say what you learn from cats is you can't become like a cat. We do obsess about the future, we can't help it. But can we control it in some way? Well, I'll conclude with this the greatest writer on cats, he only mentioned philosopher and philosophical writer on cats, is the French essayist Michel de Montaigne, my favorite mm -hmm. philosopher. And um, he said, When my cat plays with me, how do I know whether, when I'm playing with my cat, how do I know whether she is playing with me or I'm playing with her? I don't know. Cats are sort of inscrutable. And he also has the wonderful example I just mentioned. He says, too much thought is not good for life. He said, supposing every time we had to jump over a dangerous spot, we thought about it and tried to work out the best theoretical jump. He said, without being paralyzed with fear, we jump and sink. We look at a cat and just does it and jumps. Now we can't quite do that, he says. He's wise enough to know that, he says. But what we can do is rely on our natures to get us through life with a little bit of art in from time to time. We help our natures. He had a friend, a male friend, close male friend, that he was in love with him. And when the friend died, he was absolutely distraught, mm -hmm. almost desperate. And so he suffered for a while. And then he writes in one of his essays, I suffered really terribly. He said, my nature was helping, but not enough. So I, I thought I'd apply a little art. I persuaded myself to fall in love with somebody new. Did that work? Um, so uh, relying on your nature, which is what counts, rather than, than on a philosophy, where the philosophy, all the philosophy can do is really help them to think more clearly, is I think ultimately what, what counts can, can tell us. Now, in saying this, I've in a sense, I've tried to adopt the position of a fellow philosopher. I've tried to adopt, I've tried, it's impossible, of course, because I'm not a fan. But uh, I've tried to adopt the perspective cat might adopt if it had the intellectual capacities um, which are needed for philosophy. And I think there's, if a cat was like that, it would, first of all, it would never try and teach anyone anything. And it wouldn't be too serious. I think if a cat had philosophies, it would be like playing with some like little balls. Um, they would see philosophy as a form of play. I hope that what I've said is at least um, entertaining to some of you. Thank you. Well, there you have it, John Gray, the feline philosopher. Just in case, so this was great, John. Thank you very much for a yeah. very erudite and very interesting uh, exposition of what a cat might have to teach us on the meaning of life. I think what I got out of it is don't have a problem with life, don't have a problem with death, and you lead a happy life. So uh, thank you very much for that. We now come to the Q&A session. Before we do, I just want to equal the balance because I see quite a few of you who might also be dog lovers. There isn't just feline philosophers. There's one, one philosopher who takes great interest in dogs, just to balance the scale. And his name is Arthur Schopenhauer. Oh, yes. yes. So, but now Poodles. we Poodles. Poodles, yes. Poodles, especially Poodles. Exactly. Bouts and Atman. Atman, Atman. Yes. That's right. Right, Q&A session which means I shall wander around with the microphone and uh, so people can hear it online as well. Can you speak directly into this? I'm going to switch it on in a second. You have to speak directly into it like that, rather than like that, because otherwise we won't uh, be able to hear. Right, there must be loads of questions on feline philosophy. The gentleman at the front. John, thank you. Um, your last, the last chapter in your book, which is human love versus fear, fear of love, mm. and you mentioned Gettino and Maria, mm. I think, and mm. Lily, and, and you mentioned the effect on people 
when one cat ran away mm. and uh, the other she died. But my question is about uh, uh, attributes of cat. Mm. And in those situations, would influence be a, 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 a major attribute of, of a cat? You mean influence on the human? Well, I wonder how much we do really, uh, we miss them awfully, if, that when they go, if we had them, if they've lived with us for a long time. Um, they're part of our lives. They sometimes even stay with us when we're gone. I was reading someone who, uh, in a newspaper, he said, just lost a cat, been with them for 14 or 15 years, couldn't believe that the cat had actually gone, in some sense still there. There's a kind of animistic aspect of that, so I think in, in, in that way. But whether we, I think what we, what we, what, how they influence us is by, as I said right at the start, maybe giving us another a window on life which isn't purely human. I mean, I think one of the problems with a lot of philosophy, I know Andreas has thought about this, is that it's what they call rigorously anthropocentric. That's to say, it's about the human world. Um, of course, there's also the natural world, which isn't human. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, many philosophers have written as if all that matter is um, um, how to improve the human world, what human beings think of other human beings, and how humans alter the world. But if you take a larger view, um, then humans are an incident in the world, the natural world, and they can't control it, they actually don't. One of my great friends who died just recently uh, at the age of 103, James Lovelock, some of you will know that word, uh, the guy I, I knew him for maybe about 20 or 30 years of his life. He developed like the Gaia theory. And whether or not you accept the Gaia theory, which is that the, the planet is a self-regulating organism, one of the key features of the, if that theory is true, is it doesn't regulate itself for the benefit of humans. If you start disrupting it, it'll get rid of it, one way or the other. Or at any rate, it'll It'll, it'll, it'll get back to some kind of balance in which their well-being is not the key. And that's kind of some of rather a hard view of things. It's tough because it might be very painful for us, but I think it has a kind of tonic element in it, which is that our strivings, our, our worries, our anxieties are not the sum of the world. They're only a small part of it. So I think what, what cats did more than dogs, dogs are wonderful companions, I know. So there's a great picture on dogs, actually, uh, as there is on cats. They're wonderful, loving companions. What they give isn't, though, is an extension of the human world or a mirror of the human world. They enter into the human world. Cats live in the human world, as I said earlier, they're not necessarily of the human world. Um, and they have this strange thing, which, again, many people don't like. They can love us without needing us. They can really love us in the sense that they like being with us. If, by the way, an able-bodied cat who doesn't like you won't stay with you just for food. The idea of cupboard love, that they just stay because you feed, is not true. Any cat which is able-bodied and can move away it just doesn't like you. It'll not be there one day and you'll turn back. Um, I think that, that that's kind of... But that means if it does stay with you, the cat is able-bodied and can go away, it does like you. <laughs> and I think that's a kind of love. It's joy in the, um, in the, in the, in the company of another creature, in this case, a human, a, human, a human being. But it won't necessarily suffer for a long time when you're gone, and that's where humans are different, I think. I mean, one of the greatest sufferings for a human being is not the prospect of their own death. Many of us can be quite uh, unsouciant about that. Uh, it's the prospect of the death of someone they love or the bereavement, the grief they feel about someone they did love and still love, but who has died. It's a much deeper grief than, than the grief that we feel about the fact that we kind of have to die. Um, and and cats don't have that. So you can say, and I'm open to this idea, that there's certain respects in which there's a part of the kind of richness of human life, which is cats don't have. I don't feel they think they feel grief. About four, one of our three cats died as a result of the fourth time with a veterinary accident. So we're on a sad episode. Um, and um, the other three cats who were living at the time, they seemed puzzled for a while. And they missed him for a while. 
not very long. Uh, they formed a new pattern of life very quickly. And um, they seemed to quicker to get the food in the morning and uh, uh, fewer walls and so on and so forth. Uh, they adapted quite quickly. Humans aren't like that. If you're really attached to someone, you'll, you'll, you'll feel it probably for the rest of your life as long as you So cats are quite different. They may therefore be happy. That might tell us something a little more contented. It might tell us that a richer life needn't be happier. It might be more meaningful because humans seek meaning in their lives, but cats don't. And the reason that cats can be less, um, and I don't think um, Meow ever sat back and reflected, God, these humans are terrible. Look at that beautiful city who they, what happened? They're just a heap of ruins. Can't they learn from it? The answer is no, they can't. So um, uh, I don't think it did think like that. It moved on to the rest of its life in New York, uh, in London, um, and um, enjoyed that life as much as it could. In its old age, by the way, in, in Miao's old age, uh, he liked to um, sit with the uh, American war correspondent mm -hmm. and have little sips of whiskey before we went to bed. Mm -hmm. So it adapted, it adapted to the human. Uh, he was also fearless in the same way. A friend, a friend of the war correspondent brought an enormous alsatian to the, to the apartment and the cat didn't like it. And little cat drove it out, fearlessly hurled itself at the uh, cats are like that, they're, they're fearless. Good. Next question, please. We're not going to go into the, into the online, but right. Over there. Yeah, hi. Um, you mentioned that the philosophers of the Thomas maybe it's a version today. Equivalent to what? So I didn't catch that. Yeah. Yeah. Breach is a being present in the moment. Yeah, yeah. And non exception yeah. being really fucking yeah. mind. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, yes, I mean it is. Um uh I don't belong to religion myself, so speak outside him. Um the ones I know, um, but Buddhism has always attracted me in, 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 in that, that regard. But actually there was a direct effect, if not of Buddhism, then of Indian philosophy and religion on classical uh, European philosophy and religion because the um, um, skeptics, the ancient skeptics who said that, the Greek skeptics, one of them traveled with um, Alexander to India and writes about the yogis. You know, people who practice the yoga there would be Hindus rather than probably Buddhists then, or maybe Buddhist, Buddhists, uh, just about. I can't remember the exact dates now, but uh, so they achieved, they were aiming for equanimity as well. Equanimity, they were aiming to for peace of mind as well. And so I think there was a direct link between, uh, for a while, short while, between Indian philosophy and religion and, um, and Western philosophy. So to that extent, Buddhism always. Um, was an element in Western philosophy. Of course, Schopenhauer was the first one, I think this can be said, the first major European philosopher to have studied non-Western philosophy and religion. Uh, the very first, I think, were um, weren't philosophers, they were linguists and anthropology, they were Russians. Because within the Russian Empire, as it then was, Lamaistic Buddhism was very large in uh, Mongolia. And so they studied it there. We sent some people to Tibet and so on. But uh, um, I think you're absolutely right. Yes, that is a religion, but it can be any religion. I mean, what I say in the book is if you're going to take up a religion, it's um, a good idea to take up one which uh, has um, um, beautiful rituals. Because one of the observations of uh, cats is that, well, if they are anxious and they sometimes get anxious, they cure their anxieties not by trying to reason themselves into a into a state of tranquility by movement, physical movement. Um, you can you 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 would be more tranquil 
after a walk in a beautiful garden or a wood than you would be after reading a chapter of Aristotle or even Schopenhauer. Um, I don't know if Schopenhauer was, uh, he, he was addicted to routine, he did everything the same way, including taking his poodles for a walk. Um, he was very fond, though so he, did, he did have one cat, you know, because after he died, a cat was found sitting next to him. There you go. So pick a rendition of this nice music for the cats to listen to. Thank you very much. Um, my wife and I recently lost the cat. Ah, Julie. sorry to hear that. Um, I had a dog earlier. And a dog? Earlier. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. the, the cat is such an extraordinary creature. Mm. Uh, but I just wonder in what way you would introduce the cat as representing all other uh, non human uh -huh. living entities. Um, I think, particular, in particular, really of the tree of life, mm. uh, with the idea there that we have a common nucleus, mm. that everything in the tree of life mm. has in common, that uh, it connects with the phenomena. Mm -hmm. that we call being alive, mm -hmm. whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Whether it has a, its basis, an idea, a quality of sentiment, mm -hmm. uh, the capacity to feel, mm -hmm. which you know, frogs or goldfish mm -hmm. and insects uh, all do. Um, so, <clears throat> of course, if awful in tree of life, if one limb of the tree starts to turn around, mm -hmm. And devour the whole tree mm. for one reason or another. But the tree of life transcends the idea of it's not quite a delusion mm. or an illusion, something necessary, the idea of having an identity. Mm. Uh, and I'm just wondering are you casting uh, a perspective in relation to the very different thing? It's a very interesting question. I I pick cats not only because I'm so fond of them, because cats of all the creatures with who humans have interacted for a long time and who've entered human households, is I think the least human, the least humanized. That's the reason. Uh, um, uh, I mean, maybe birds are have not been humanized, but we can't interact with them the way we do with, with, with cats. Cats have this remark, in other words, we can interact closely and intimately with them. They can know our lives, they can get used to us, they can become fond of us and so on. But they remain non-human. That's more than, um, certainly more than dogs, maybe more than horses, maybe more than, uh, they, 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 they're, they're a wholly different species. They're like angels or, uh, um, um, Iphone, it's like an iPhone window, and he looks, they suppose, in Russian Orthodox religion, you, you look out of the world through the icon. Um, and so like that. And that's why I picked them because um, uh, for the subject of the book, because if you're a critic of what I earlier called and what many people call anthropocentrism, then you don't want it just to focus on those, those uh, animals or other living creatures that have similar traits, similar virtues, similar. To humans, you want to look at something which are quite different. And cats really are different. They're very, very different. Um, and um, if you ever see pictures of uh, cats on Greek islands, there are some Greek islands, also Japanese islands, where there are hundreds of cats. And if you watch them at sunset, they're all sitting pleasantly watching the sun go down. Now, are they thinking the sun tomorrow might be more beautiful? I wish we could get to tomorrow and we could see that more. No, they're not thinking that. Are they thinking, uh, God, a nuclear bomb might blow up this or blow the whole thing up? No, they're not thinking that either. Um, they're, they're absorbed in the moment. By the way, uh, I once spoke to a, um, an expert on climate behavior and I asked whether the monkeys that are closest to humans um, have a, a sense of beauty like humans do. And he said, well, they do sit watching the sunset. This is these were monkeys, he said. But on the other hand, I've seen, I've seen them sitting in front of a brick wall and watching them for hours. So I thought, well, yeah, they are a bit like humans after all. Here. 
a true story. It's one of the world's greatest primatologists. Just before we ask the next question, can I just push in here and change the setting so we can let our online audience try right. this as well? One second. Here they are. Okay. Okay, the online audience can now unmute themselves and also show the video. But before we get to those questions, I think there was a gentleman here who also had a question and one day. So we keep on going in the room first. Uh, John, mm. you suggested that you hold your mic on cats and cat intelligence might be something quite alien. And dog intelligence might be, I think you said, an extension of a human. No, no, that's. That it could be humanized more than cats have been humanized. Not that it's originally an extension, because there are lots of wild dogs right. in the world. But okay. but when they've been domesticated or entered into the human world, they become more human. That's what I would say, com compared with cats. And that's even genetically true, I think. Could you say something about the possibilities of intelligence that comes from the human force, an extension directly from human, one that we create mm. uh, an artificial intelligence that uh, maybe in some cases, it seems unlikely. Well, James Lovelock, um, last book was on what he called hyperintelligence. He wrote it when he was over 100. Very good book. Uh, when he died, he died after a fall. His mind was still very bright when he died. Um, he was writing another book, which we won't get now, which I would love to have seen. But he thought that um, artificial intelligence was evolving independently almost of human beings. Of course, humans had created the infrastructure, the, the computers, the quantum mechanics, all the rest of it. He thought a process of evolution, a bit like Darwin's, would, was taking place and that um, a new uh, level of hyperintelligence could and, and would develop. So I, I don't rule that out by myself. Whether these would be uh, these intelligences, if there were several or if there was only one. I tend to think there could be several, actually. I don't see why not. But uh, whether they would be friendly to us or hostile to us, or more, I think, indifferent to us, actually. They might not. Um, I asked Jim, Jim Lodder this once. He said, oh, they'll probably be quite friendly to us. He said, we'll be a bit like Kew Gardens to them. I said, what do you mean Kew Gardens? He went to find flowers. They'll keep some of us for sure, you know. Uh, Go and look at us from time to time, and uh, um, um, and the, the uh, so I wouldn't worry about them being necessarily hostile. There's a tremendous amount of I mean, I'm, some of them might be hostile. I know people who study the study war, and they are worried about um, robotic uh, systems that get programmed to do certain things, and we'll just do them come what may. There's also one feature of artificial intelligence much quicker than human intelligence. And that poses particular risks in certain areas. It means that there isn't time. I mean, we've been saved from nuclear war at least twice, once in 1962 and once in the 1980s, by a human person intervening. The first time was a, a Soviet um, submariner who refused to follow orders. Uh, and so the balloon didn't go up. I'm old enough to remember it. Some of you may be very tense for you to be sound. That was. Um, we didn't quite know what was going on, but we knew it was John of Close. Um, but if it all happens in a nanosecond, then it's tougher. So there are reasons to worry, but not, I think, that they'll necessarily be hostile. They'll only be, I suppose, if they're programmed to be hostile to start with to the humans. It, Program to be hostile to some people. By the way, this goes back. I mean, I'm not an artificial intelligence, but the idea of breeding post human. Stalin tried to do it. He, um, um, in Georgia, where he came from, he set up a laboratory where um, chimps were brought from all over the world and uh, human volunteers, in quotes, were supposed to make this. Of course, it didn't work. And um, uh, the chips there were, were still there years later. They were used later uh, in um, spacecraft, spaceflight, and so on. And they only they seem to have died when there was a civil war in uh, in Georgia in the two thousands. Um, but um, so the idea of breeding new forms of life, which have 
uh, post-human forms, if you like, which have specific goals, that might, that might still happen. But again, if there's evolution, they could transcend those goals. They have their own goals then. I don't see why they shouldn't have their own. So I think it can happen. I mean, uh, uh, it, it would just be an extension of Darwinian evolution. But remember, Darwinian evolution in Darwin's theory doesn't have any goal. He was inconsistent on this. I don't know if you, if you, if you read the last, uh, the penultimate paragraph, paragraph of um, um, Origins of Species, he, he, he says, and so we see this, man, this is Darwin the Victorian, great progressive railways, all this kind of thing we're making. He says, so we see this, he started with soil, with worms, you get gradually up and eventually get to all of us, the wonderful, fantastic Victorian humans. But in another of his writings, in his autobiography, actually, he says, um, evolution is like the wind, it just blows whichever way it wants. Remember, it's a random process, basically. Natural selection is the run, evolution for God is the natural selection of random mutations. Didn't sort of didn't point to us, might, might not have ended up with us if various things hadn't happened, some of which would be uh, chance. So we don't know, but I think it's perfectly possible, perfectly conceivable that these will, will uh, take. I mean, in fact, there are even people who say they seriously believe that the world that you and I are all inhabiting right now is a part of a box set. It's part of a, a virtual world which has been created. Um, if so, I sometimes want to speed it up. I get you on the television. Uh, um, uh, that, that's an unreal thing, which I so we saw some higher minders looking down us and say, uh, let's see what they do next, which is what the like, what the Greek gods were. Remember, we think of the Greek gods. The Greek gods envied the mortality of humans because they were bored with immortality. So what they did was they, they sometimes, right at the start of the Iliad, if I remember right now, it's two, two uh, um, vultures land and they're two gods. And they say, let's, let's give them a war, boring watching them, boring lives. We are bored and they are bored. Let's stir it all a bit. And so it might be that we're in a box set now. That, uh, it'd be a very small moment in the box set. But um, uh, I don't think that, actually. I don't think that, that's a slightly paranoid idea. But some people, some people, there are, there are whole books of philosophy written on the supposition that that might be true. I don't think it is true. Or at least I'm not convinced it's true. So we can observe uh, what cats are doing, uh, what they're not doing. Um, but isn't it getting very tricky to apply human concepts mm. when, when we begin to infer things like cats being independent, cats loving us, uh, cats like this or like that? Um, we, we can't get rid of our human concepts. Mm. Uh, can we really apply them? Very good so question. For what yeah. pets are doing, wanting, and wanting. It's a very good question. Wittgenstein, a very great philosopher, said, if a lion spoke, we would not understand it. But I know you, someone, for a number of years, who kept lions. He said, it just shows that Wittgenstein knew lucky nothing about lions. I, I, I knew someone who kept lions and kept um, a man who written a well, great success in breeding lions and also by simulating their natural environments. It's not unusual, it's not surprising if you think about it, a lot of zoos. One of the reasons why the wild animals and zoos don't breed is they don't normally live on concrete floors. So you can create, I used to visit this man where he lived, a man of considerable wealth. So we have had these um, lions and monkey. And he, he said that he could interact with them, but he did interact with them. I only had one experience myself, which was interacting when he was dying, actually, interacting with um, gorillas that he owned. I didn't go into the, into the cage, but I did give them some specially prepared sweets that he'd had made for them. Because as he pointed out, he said, the gorilla palate, John, is infinitely more delicate than the human palate. So he'd had some special sweets made for them. And it, gorillas are so much closer to us than lions. Uh, genetically. I don't see why. I don't see why we can't infer. We can surely tell when, an, when, a, when, a, when a cat is in pain. We can tell that. We can tell when it's running away. We can tell. Can't we tell when it's content and happy, when it stretches out and so on? 
So they're not, they, 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 there's enough in common between us and even cats, which are the least human, or the non-human animals we frequently interact with, that we have something in common. There's enough feeling, there's enough commonality of, um, uh, we know when a cat is thirsty, we know when a cat is hungry, so we know when we are thirsty and hungry. So I, um, I don't think it's true that we, we, we we're, that they're completely blank. There's a danger of anthropomorphism, which I think is what you're talking to, which is well, thinking of non-human things as human. I think actually we anthropomorphize ourselves too much. I think we're actually less human than we think we are. And uh, that you see that in terrible ways during times of extremity. We shed the human quite quickly. Um, um, one of the uh, camp survivors uh, in the Soviet Union, as mentioned, he said he was put in a camp uh, up in uh, the gold mining area of Siberia. He survived by the way. And he um, wrote many stories about it. He said, in his experience, it took three weeks to shed your humanity, roughly speaking. He said, the ones who took longer, who were religious believers, they were tougher and more meaning in their lives. The ones who shed it more quickly with the party people, party people who were put there by the party and felt betrayed and so on. And the others were the professional criminals. They lasted a long time because the camps were basically run by professional criminals. Um, uh, so, but also, of course, we can be less human in another way, which is that people can be extraordinarily normal from time to time in ways that you wouldn't expect it, of human beings. They'll give away their lives, they'll do something they really value, they'll, they'll do something with no reward. One person I admire, who's still alive, is the cat man of Aleppo. Have you ever heard of him? A devastated city. Not making a political comment, but it's just devastated. There are lots of cats there. But he was just a driver, he was an ambulance driver. And he, he, the last I heard of him, he was still like driving around, feeding the cats. So that's interspecies love. He loves the cats. Whether they love him, I don't know. But uh, um, so uh, we're not as human as we think we are, and that can be both a. We should be as wary of anthropomorphizing each other and ourselves as we are of anthropomorphizing uh, other, other 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 creatures. Thank you. If you have a book coming on, what's the time to be a cat? Mm -hmm. Albert Eugene. Well, a cat wouldn't write it, would it? <laughs> so I, I wanted to um, uh, speak slightly against cats as, yeah. as, um, yeah. as some, some uh, a way of looking at philosophy, um, in the sense that a number of the issues that, that we're faced with mm. these days in terms of leading the best life mm. are much bigger scale issues mm. and longer term issues. So mm. issues like climate change, mm. um, the, the whole global interconnectivity, mm. Um, in, mm. inequality mm. Uh, and mm. geopolitical issues mm. require us leading the best life to think and way beyond ourselves, both mm. in terms of spatially mm. and temporally. Mm. So um, could we not argue that looking to cats for a philosophy mm. is, is too limited because they that's mm. exactly what they don't do? Yes, you could argue that, you'd be quite right. Um, on the other hand, if I trying to be a fellow philosopher, I might say that the capacity of humans to affect these vast issues is very low too. Because the human species is like other species, it's not an agent. There's no global cat trying to realize itself throughout history. But I think, I think there's no global uh, human agent. There are different institutions, different groups, different philosophies, different projects, different religions going on in the world, as it always have been, and it might be always will be. Um, so that you could say against your view, which is perfectly true, um, perfectly sound, that um, humans um, have much greater power than any other animal, including um, we talk about this in the, the Anthropocene, I've heard that term. term, it means the, the period in the world when what human beings do affects the whole world, including all the other animals, um, it affects the climate, anthropogenic climate change occurred locally before now, for example, there was a time when Homer's day, the, the Greek islands were covered with uh, wood, the woods, now only a few of them are, 
That was anthropogenic change that were tracked down and destroyed. But it's only now that was global climate, global anthropogenic change, because um, humans have uh, invented industry and um, lots of other things in which they, they exert greater power over the environment and natural environment, for good or bad. Uh, the question is, can would you resolve that? Like if you're a cat, you'd have some doubts. Um, that's all I would say. I'm not trying to discourage anyone from acting. If you're a cat, also you would would wish well anyone who tried to alter these uh, these trends. But you probably wouldn't um, if you're a cat. Um, um, uh, attach much uh, much weight to them. I think that the hardest thing to shake is the anthropomorphic notion of humans as a, an acting agent. So humanity should do this, humanity should do that. Um, um, or even humanity is doing this or is doing that. Well, there isn't a sort of what there are, are human beings. I don't just mean individuals, groups, religions, uh, collectivities, uh, movements, projects. Um, uh, they're all in the mix. Um, but there's no guiding hand. I think, by the way, not that you would think this at all, I'm sure nobody here would, but one of the things I found in my travels you know, earlier in life when I was in America and elsewhere was that conspiracy theorists think someone's in charge. If something bad happens, who did it and why? And they would say, there are these sort of people that are hanging in the parents. Well, I've been, I've met some of them. They know nothing from nothing. I have no idea what's happening most of the time. No one is in charge. No one is in charge. And if you look at um, interest, if you read really, really good histories of wars, of um, revolutions, and, and of also progressive movements of various kinds, you see that whether they're good or bad, no one's manipulating, no one's controlling them. People make different uh, contributions to them. And I tend to think the view that everything that happens in the human world is intended by someone is a very toxic view because if it means all the evils in the world are done by someone so if you or some group so if you think that what's the natural conclusion get rid of those people and all will be well the jews it will be the chips it will be whoever it is get rid of them everything will be fine <clears throat> um doesn't work out like that you know? it, it just leads to an idea this i'm afraid is kind of straight to politics but uh, I'm sure a cat will be um, bemused by some of the things coming out of American politics at the moment. Uh, um, when actually nothing that ever happens has a single factory basis. Somebody's beaten to death. Oh, I wasn't really beaten to death. No, no. Somebody was sent to beat him. Or maybe he beat himself to death. Who knows? Um, it's, uh, uh, it, we've, we've sunk into a kind of conspiracy mentality in which um, at least part of the world have in which it's not accepted that something's happened. For example, a nuclear war could happen without anybody being involved. Any human could all be artificial intelligence now. Admittedly, you would say, well, somebody's developed those weapons and created them, but no one actually presses the button. Or if they do press, I believe, by the way, in, in, in both in Western countries and in Russia, it isn't just one human. I'm told it's three. It has to go through and series of steps. Um, but um, sometimes there's genuine error. The last big threat in that respect I read was in the early 80s when a large exercise conducted in the West was misinterpreted in Russia as the beginning of a nuclear assault. So they got to the brink of responding and someone said, goodness, might not be. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't ever intended. So but now things could happen so quickly that, and who would be responsible for that? We'd be, it would, that would be a kind of uh, a fate that no human being had ever intended, but that happened as a result of other things that have been done by human beings. Okay, well, we'll shift from the artificial intelligence. Now go to the artificial world online. I'll All right. Read out a couple of questions. But All right. You are online. I want to ask a question. Can you just please unmute yourself and slow your hands so I can you off and then ask you a question? So the first one on lines by Daniel. How about cats to cat relationships? I thought cats invest a lot of effort in planning in avoiding confrontation. 
I wouldn't say they invest a lot of effort in anything very much, but uh, <laughs> but they um, they tend if you have well we have four cats living together they tend to evolve a kind of modus vivendi but if any of you have cats you'll know if you introduce a new cat into an existing cat household it doesn't always go well because they form habits and they and cats although they're very flexible paradoxically they also love routine and they don't like their their habits to be disrupted by other other cats or or attention to be drawn away from I think on the whole, I mean, cats are different from, I had a friend, um, a philosopher who kept a wolf, not the same one I was talking about for someone who lived in America, lived with a wolf for um, I think about five or six years, and uh, wrote a book about it called The Philosopher and the Wolf, you can find it on the internet, um, a very good book, and because wolves are pretty hierarchical, um, just as most of the human, most of the apes, the primates that are close to humans are hierarchical. Animals. Cats aren't that high like you got. There may be a one cat that insists on being first and getting to the ball, but the hierarchies they have are fluid, they don't come very much. And of course, one of the reasons for that is that in the wild, they're very often um, they live as um, solitary hunters. So they don't have to inter they don't have to interact with each other. It's a bit different. Some some big cats, hunters groups and so on, so there's some variation, but there, there aren't fixed hierarchies, or there isn't even the attempt to establish fixed hierarchies, which there is in some of them. So I don't think they work hard on it, but I, th I see what they're getting. They, they get used to each other, and they like um, living in harmony with each other up to a point. Um, and um, ours, as I say, um, I should say, when we got our second pair, we were advised by the breeder to introduce them very gradually. So we had to put them in a room, Keep them in that room for a couple of days before um, releasing them into the house. And uh, when they release them in the house, to give more attention to the previous two cats than the new ones. And that would reassure the old cats. So the new ones were so young and happy and running around and they wouldn't even notice which they didn't. And as a result of that advice, they live in, um, in as far as we can observe, complete harmony for 10 years or so. One of them would one of them die. Um, so, um, so I think that's another aspect. You see, the kind of problem of order in society is a peculiarly human problem. Do we have egalitarian order, hierarchical order, non monarchical order, republican order? Cats just do form what I call flexible, fluid modus within die. They just coexist with you. They do fight, of course, as well over territory sometimes. And some of you will also. Uh, no, they're trying to establish. They are somewhat territorial. Well, there is a question online, and that is by Mahazabin. Do you think cats are or could ever be persons? Well, I could turn around. Do you think humans are or ever could be persons? Uh, you know, what's a person? I mean, there are questions out there about um, artificial intelligence. Can how do you tell when? Um, an artificial intelligence reacts to you as if it was a person, but it is a person. That's one of the deep problems in the philosophy of artificial intelligence. By the way, it's a practical problem to some extent. Sometimes it's almost poignant. The head of uh, Google uh, engineering, he's my brother Ray Kurzweil, if you've ever heard of him, and he does many things for Google. But one of the things he's been working on for many years is trying to create an avatar of his father who died so he can converse with his father, uh, his possibly his, his, his deceased father. And his reasoning is if he feeds in lots of information from lots of sources about his father that were never put together again, then the conversation will be real in the sense that the avatar of the father will be able to tell him things that the real father then told him. But you know, if you're Skeptically, you, you know, you feel, you still feel, at least I feel, but there's nothing behind the avatar. There's nothing there. And how do you see that he might say, well, there might be something there. I might have actually created, I don't, I, I can't imagine that as that as other than a kind of illusion. But that doesn't mean there couldn't be a time in the future where machines, machines would acquire uh, sentience 
and even acquire conscious awareness and the ability to interact with, with, with each other. I mean, it's the stuff of science fiction now, because probably because it's quite close. I mean, now it's not that inconceivable that it, that it could be that it could be done. Um, I, I tend to, I tend, it's a very good question you've asked, but I tend to think that we use the, we give too much attention to the term person. Um, I think the original meaning of it is mask, actually. Um, it's, it's what we, cats in that sense, by the way, aren't perfect. I start by saying, cats don't have an image of themselves that they try and project on the world. They don't care what other cats would, how other think of them or what human beings think of them. Um, they just live according to um, their own impulses, their own age, their, their own nature. So, and they can't, as I mentioned, they can't recognize themselves uh, in, a, in, in a mirror. So they aren't persons in that sense, but is being a person the supreme thing to be? Is, uh, um, is, 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 is personhood what makes uh, humans uh, different from other, other animals? Okay, and you brought another question, which I think uh, might be quite a short answer. All right. Would human beings do well to nap so often and so long as cats do? <laughs> um, yes, is the answer. One of, in the book, I have 10 cat hints on how to live well. Not commandments, cats will never issue commandments. And one is sleep for pleasure, not profit. But what that I mean is people say, I've got to get to sleep because I've got work to do tomorrow. That's fair enough. If that's a situation, fine. But don't, don't sleep in order to do something else. Uh, ideally speaking, you should sleep for pleasure. And if that happens during the day, yeah, that's, that's fine. On the other hand, doctors say you shouldn't sleep too much. And it might be that cats can benefit from longer periods of sleeping in a day than human beings. I mean, after all, in the jungles, when they're not hunting, what do they do? When they're not hunting or mating, what do they do? Sleep. Uh, we're not quite in that. In, 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 in that. But I think the capacity for napping is much, much underrated. That's certainly a practical tip for the good life we can learn from it. Nap when it suits you, if you can. Good. Well, I think on that note... We'll Even during talks on philosophy. <laughs> on, on that note, we, we'll draw the evening to a conclusion. But just before I tell you about an event that's coming up very shortly, can you please put your hands together to thank John Gray for excellent. Okay, uh, just a couple of short things. I think Reese is still here from Topping. So if you want to have a signed copy of, of John's book, please go into the annex room there. I also would like to thank uh, all the colleagues and volunteers, especially Kiri and Betty, who've made uh, today possible with all their work. So thank you very much to all of those. And also, finally, next month, the philosophy series at the BLSI concludes with Professor A.C. Grayling coming to visit us. And he's, um, the title of his uh, talk is gonna be, and I'm paraphrasing here, will the world ever be able to agree on anything? And that's on St. Nicholas Day, the 6th of December uh, this year. So in the meantime, have a safe journey home, and I shall see you next month. All the very best. <laughs>